Yes, good afternoon and welcome. We will begin. So thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar. Um, we at Cleveland State University's Cleveland Marshall College of Law are so excited to bring you a webinar hosted by our Master of Legal Studies in Cybersecurity and Data Privacy to discuss how to start a career in cybersecurity and data privacy. I feel very fortunate to have two experts in the field join me today to discuss this, but first I wanna introduce myself. I am Julie DiBiasio, the Director of Graduate Studies and Professional Development here at Cleveland Marshall College of Law. And as I look at the attendee list, um, I feel very fortunate that I've had the opportunity to speak with many of you. So it's so nice to see you on this webinar today. Um, joining me today is Kirk Harris, who is the former Chief Privacy Officer at Nationwide Insurance. Um, he now teaches in our Master of Legal Studies program. He teaches the Privacy Law and Management course. You're gonna hear from him throughout the most of this presentation today. And I know that he's the reason that you're here. So I'll quickly go over and introduce Professor Brian Ray. Brian Ray directs and co-founded our Center for Cybersecurity and Privacy Protection. He also created this Master of Legal Studies degree and teaches in this program. So you are in great hands and you're very lucky um, if you decide to do this program to have Brian Ray as one of your professors. So Brian, I'm gonna turn it over to you to of course introduce our special guest a bit more and kick off our presentation. Thanks, Julie. Uh, and welcome everybody, um, both those who are here live and those who are gonna be watching this in the recording. Uh, it's great to see so much interest in this topic um, and in our program. So as Julie mentioned, I uh, co-founded and direct the center um, here at Cleveland Marshall and created this degree. Uh, and one of the things I wanna emphasize and, and Kirk and I'll talk about is I did not have any technical background at all. Um, I, like, I like to joke, although it's true that uh, I completed one of my two science credits as an undergrad uh, taking pre-Copernican astronomy. Um, so I learned um, how, how, to, how to continue to believe that the earth is at the center of the universe. Um, I don't actually believe that, but um, really want to emphasize that this program is for both uh, folks with technical backgrounds and those with no technical backgrounds. Uh, and we're going to talk about why, um, how we do that and, and why it's important to, to recognize that the roles in this field sort of straddle uh, both ends of that spectrum. Um, Julie, go ahead and, and flip us to the next slide. So we're going to quickly now uh, go into the meat of our program, which is how do you get started in a career um, and how do you do it, whether you have technical or, or, or don't have any technical experience. Um, and then uh, we'll walk you through the program um, and then um, Julie will take it back over and tell you how to get more information um, if you're interested. And so let's go on to the next slide. Okay, and so um, this is what we're here to talk about. Um, what do you need to do to get in this field and why is the degree that we offer? Um, uh, you, really, we think it's unique in the field. It's certainly, um, it's certainly distinctive, but so far we haven't found one exactly like it. Um, and, and more specifically, why do you need to understand the law and get a legal background as well as a technical uh, grounding, which, um, which we provide in this field? And that's why we've got um, Kirk Harris here with us, um, another lawyer like me, uh, but a lawyer who really grew up as the field of data privacy in particular, but cybersecurity as well, uh, started to move, well, the data privacy became a field and cybersecurity started to move um, from a kind of IT plumbing issue into a core strategic um, issue uh, involving compliance and law. Uh, and so Julie, go to the next slide. And um, what, what Kirk and I are gonna talk about is this massive expansion, uh, really the, the creation of the field from the beginning, uh, and then the massive and continuing expansion of um, legal and compliance obligations um, in cybersecurity and data privacy, and why you really need to understand um, how, that, how those things um, evolve, what they mean, um, and how to work with 
lawyers, if you're on the, and compliance folks, if you're on the technical side, and as a compliance person uh, or a lawyer, and we have we have several lawyers who are going through this program, how to work with the technical side, and that is um, that you know that is at the core of what we do. And so with that, I'm going to bring Kirk back on, um, or actually bring Kirk on. We introduced you, Kirk. Um, let's talk a little bit about your career and um, and give our our attendees a little bit of a sense of you know how you got started in this because you like me. Um, weren't, weren't thinking at all that you'd be involved in technical topics like this. So how did, how did you get started? Um, and what was, what was your, your genesis ultimately uh, resulting in heading um, the privacy as well as much, much of the security on the compliance side for um, a large national insurer like Nationwide? Sure, sure. Well, thank you. Thank you, Brian, Julia. I appreciate the offer to be here today. And and I'll start from in the beginning, right? A little bit of Genesis going here. In the beginning, you know, I was not a privacy professional. There were no privacy professionals. Cybersecurity, as Brian alluded, did not really exist outside of a, a very, very small boutique part of, of information technology. And it was generally not very well coordinated. And then a, a series of events happened uh, most notably HIPAA, which had really nothing to do with privacy, right? And it and, and it, just to jump in, Kirk, um, for those who aren't familiar, HIPAA is the major health yep. um, regulation that it, it does many things, but also includes extensive privacy and security obligations. It, one of the things you'll learn about in our program. Exactly, and HIPAA was designed really to make healthcare efficient and affordable and portable. And you know, had a lot to do with, with digitizing, uh, digitizing health records, right? Making health records uh, electronic so that uh, they could be used easier and, and kind of take human beings out of the process. And as part of that, right, you had data. And, and so privacy and then the protection of privacy, which is security, protection of data, kind of jumped to the forefront as a, as a it still wasn't a huge issue, but it was a, it was an issue. It was seen as a, as an issue. And that was 1992, 93, 94. That was sort of the, in the United States anyway, where, where privacy happened first. And then in the mid nineties, Europe passed what they called their EU data privacy directive, which again was the, predecessor of what you see on the screen here of GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. It wasn't very effective, it wasn't very uniform, and, and they did scrap it for GDPR. And then in the late 90s, the United States passed a, a bill called graham leach Bliley Act, which again, had almost nothing to do with privacy. It had to do with you know uh, financial services and how financial services companies can affiliate and and what, but the byproduct was you're going to create these massive companies with all of this data. And again, like HIPAA, where there is data, there are proponents of protecting privacy and then obviously it's security because you cannot have privacy without security. You literally can't. And if you, jo if you join this program, you will, you will learn that. And that is a truism. You can have you can have security without privacy, but you cannot have privacy without security. Um, myself, I, how did you know what what does that mean for me? Well, I was actually I was a I was the federal lobbyist for Nationwide Insurance during the '90s, and so I happened to uh, to be part of the HIPAA and the Graham Leach Bliley, and to some degree uh, the European uh, Data Protection uh, Directive because of uh, we had a lot of uh, companies over in, in Europe at the time. And so I worked on these bills and I, I gained a, a bit of an expertise. And, and then when Graham Leach finally passed in late 99 and, and we had you know, privacy obligations for financial service companies, uh, I was asked, since I knew a little bit about it because I worked on the bill, I was asked to lead this privacy compliance function, which very quickly, um, I realized was a program and not a project. I, I asked to, to, to be able to lead it. They said, you know, are you sure? Right, because I was leaving a pretty good gig in, in government relations. 
I said, yeah, this is very exciting. I think it's, it's uh, I really see that this has a lot of legs. I think this is going to be something big. And it, and it has been, right? So out of, out of that, we ended up with, you know, all the state breach notification laws, all those notification letters that, uh, that you periodically get about some company having their data stolen by, by a bad guy. Um, you know, that, that swept, uh, that swept the, com- the country, as did um, a lot of more boutique, uh, boutique laws. And, uh, you know, privacy now is, uh, includes, you know, telephonic privacy, right? The right, the, right not, the right to be left alone, right? Be able to tell telemarketers not to call you anymore. Uh, do not call lists. It, it, it includes, you know, the right not to be spammed by marketers online. You know, you can go in and opt out of, uh, of companies sending you commercial, uh, commercial email. It, it's, quite, it's quite broad. And then really what happened to a lot of us who started out in privacy is that we, you know, parallel to us building our programs, the cybersecurity or information security components of our organizations began maturing and growing. In, fr- in, in fact, you know, they, in, in almost all cases, you know, outstrip the privacy function in, in size by, you know, orders of magnitude by five to 10 times what the privacy function was in any organization, right? It just, and it got centralized and it became much more mature. Um, and then a lot of us became effectively the legal and compliance advisors for our information security and technology partners in our companies. And that's where you sort of got the merging of, uh, of privacy and cybersecurity from a legal perspective. It's, it's, you know, does it help to have a technical background? Uh, it does help a little bit in the beginning, right? Just because the concepts probably aren't art is alien to you but i can assure you like uh, like brian that you know the only the only uh, computer class that i took uh, until i was named chief privacy officer 20 years ago was i you know i, I took a introduction to uh, computers class in college when i was you know and this was in the early 80s we were still doing you know punch cards and mainframes and you know that was about it uh, from my experience up to that point, and most of what I've learned, I've learned on the job, and I've learned at the elbow of some really smart uh, technology people. But if you, you know, if you, if you, if you read, I do read quite extensively. You read, and and you are aware, and there's lots of good online resources, and there's this program uh, that will give you the kind of the, the 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 key ingredients into how to access everything, which is you know, which is really. Um, I mean, any any course of study is is there to uh, to expose you to issues, to expose you to ways of thinking, and and more importantly, to expose you to how to access kind of the body of knowledge that is out there, right? I mean, you're nobody learns everything about everything. Um, even those of us who are lawyers, right, who had to par- pass the bar, uh, the bar in the states where we're licensed, right? I mean, you you know a little bit about everything. You're an inch deep and a mile wide, but, it, but what law in particular and what this program specifically will teach you is how to how to analyze issues against against frameworks and then more importantly, you know, how to get how to how to access the body of knowledge in order to come up with solutions to the problems that you're analyzing, right? And that's really what any any good education will provide you is that that ability to think on your feet and to use the resources available to you to to solve problems. Yeah, and I, and I want to dig in a little bit more into that before we do that. Julie, will you go to the next slide for us? And so um, this is a, a a massively expanding area. Um, for both on the legal side and of course on the technical side, the stories appear daily in the news. Um, and of course that, that translates into tremendous demand. Um, and here we've got a recent story from the New York Times, particularly there'll be three and a half million open cybersecurity jobs across the globe in 2021. Of course, many of those um, 
are going to be specifically technical jobs. Um, but we also just recently hosted a webinar with the leading um, leading staffing and headhunter agency in the privacy field, um, and their experience. They're you know uh, in in the in the in the coal face of of putting people in these positions and hearing from employers who want jobs is that during the pandemic, privacy expanded. Um, privacy jobs in particular were recession proof um, because with the with the shift to remote and the expansion of these laws um those con those concerns uh, just increased and um and and there's a growing understanding and recognition in the c-suite that look this is something we really got to start to step up for uh, and take care of and so uh, there's no question that both on the technical and compliance sides of the equation um we're seeing uh, tremendous demand um and so let, let me quickly um Go back to you, Kirk. And of course, as Chief Privacy Officer at Nationwide, as, as you mentioned, you you had visibility and some responsibility, head responsibility on the on the data privacy, but substantial responsibility on the cybersecurity side as well. As both you did your own hiring within this field for for the folks that reported to you, and as you you as you participated in and, and saw the, um, the the CISO and the technical side hire, what were you looking for? And what were the what were the kinds of skill sets and credentials um, that made someone appealing to you? Well, well, early on, obviously, we you know we had to kind of grow our own because there were, um, you know, there were no certifications. There were, there really was nothing that we learned in in school. There were no programs available, and so you know, early on, I was looking for people who literally just had an interest in in what it was we were doing now later on right there were certain indicia that you looked at that would kind of authenticate that the person really did have an interest in the area and then you know that ultimately um that ultimately came you know on the resume you'd look to see whether or not they had a you know a certification like a certified information privacy professional. There's several of those out there, different types from the International Association of Privacy Professionals. Uh, whether they had uh, they had taken certain courses of, uh, of study, um, you know, in particular, uh, you know, by the 2010s, that area, I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of schools had, uh, they had a privacy class or, 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 or technology policy class or, Things that that you know would be some indicia that that they had they had an interest in it and that they had they had studied uh, in that area. Um, you know, obviously, you know, having having some having some uh, experience in the space uh, was was also you know a great boon to candidates and and uh, you know so. Having some technical, having some technical background, um, along with maybe being a paralegal or or a lawyer, uh, certainly certainly helped. But it it but I can tell you that it it didn't always you know wasn't always just because you had a you were a, uh, maybe a security architect and also a lawyer did not mean that I immediately hired you. Right, there were other other factors as well uh, that came along with that, but. But having some indicia that you are interested in having, um, uh, and and that's where I think, you know, the Cleveland Marshall's Master of Legal Studies in Cyber uh, Security and Privacy, I think that is, uh, you know, that's much stronger than than a certification. A certification, right? Most, you know, most recently, intelligent people can study for a certification in a couple of weeks and probably pass it with a passing grade, which in most places is like, you know, 70% or 80%. And that's good. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing certifications. I mean, they're certainly, they're certainly good, but, you know, to have, to have on your resume, a uh, completed master's prepared, um, to be masters prepared in cybersecurity and privacy certainly uh, is the equivalent of of all of all of all certifications combined, and 
And to me, that shows, you know, a well-rounded individual because the privacy certification will only provide you with a, a sliver of what you're going to be doing. So if it's CIPP US, right, you're just, you're learning about basically US privacy laws. If it's C, then you're learning about the Canadian privacy laws. If it's T, then you may understand a little bit about of privacy laws, but you, you know, you, you're more on the technology side. Um, and, and so I, you know, the curriculum at Cleveland Marshall in this, in this course of study, I, it provides the student with a well-rounded education in all of the areas that you are going to possibly be involved in or expected to be involved in and responsible for. And so again, from, from the all things being equal, if I had two candidates in front of me, one who, you know, one who had nothing or one who had, you know, maybe a certification and one who, you know, had the MLS, uh, then I certainly would hire the MLS candidate over over the other candidate, just because um, you still have to obviously teach them about your organization and and every organization has their own unique policies and procedures and culture and all that good stuff. Right? I mean, that's you can't you can't you know you you can't come in prepared for all of that. But but I I know that you are you are I would know that you would be relatively capable and quickly of doing pretty much anything that I would ask you to do, and I wouldn't have to teach you from the ground up about about it. Uh, and I, you know, frankly, you know, you, you may actually be able to teach me a thing or two because every new person in the organization obviously has a different perspective on, uh, on things, particularly solutions. And, you know, there's a lot of different, there's, a, there's a lot of different solutions for the same problem. So, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, having a master's in, in this area would definitely, um, it would definitely separate the candidates from the herd. I can tell you that. And 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 relevant to that, Julie, if you could go on to the next slide. So here, um, uh, and Kirk shared this with me. Kirk and I are both part of uh, the state of Ohio's primary, actually, really our only cybersecurity data privacy policy advisory group, the Cyber Ohio Advisory Board. Um, and and before we close, we really ought to touch on the Ohio privacy. Act that we worked on, but um, this is some nice data that the state shared with the board. Um, they're participating in a pilot project with the U.S. Department of Education to track outcomes of specific degrees. Now, our degree is too new to have been part of this data set, uh, but it's general master's degree in the computer science area, uh, and you can see over time um, the 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 lighter sort of um, blue at the the smaller box. At 68,000 is one year post grad, uh, five years post grad, uh, and then the dark box is uh, 10 years post grad. And you compare that to uh, a certification or um, or an undergraduate degree, and especially in that third box, it, you know, it's substantially higher. Um, and that that underscores the the point that that Kirk was making, which is uh, uh, the difference between a master's degree and a and a and a certification is the master's degree is giving that much deeper view. Um, now, because masters in this area, and especially legal masters, are, are a new phenomenon. We're one of a handful uh, of legal masters um, that, that exist, or really any masters that go in depth in the law. Um, for some employers who don't, who don't know them, you may have to do some, you know, some explanation. But from a substantive perspective, you're really getting that 360 degree view um, that will give you a grounding and an understanding of the issues you're going to encounter from entry level up through um, leadership positions, even in the C-suite. Um, and so that's that, that's really one of the things that we emphasize is we you know we go a lot deeper in each of the courses, um, and we and we go across the full spectrum of issues that you're going uh, to encounter, as opposed to as Kirk mentioned the certifications um, that really hone in on trying to give you a um, a sort of boot camp version of specific subsets. Now, in talking to um, to that placement agency that I mentioned before, um, the staffing agency, 
the certifications are still important, especially for that entry level position because they are known and especially those IAPP certifications that Kirk mentioned. And so one of the other things that we do in the program is we have a, we have a strong relationship with IAPP uh, and we're on the cusp of signing an agreement with them, which will give our students heavily discounted access to those certifications and the, the prep materials. And as we'll talk about more, many of our courses are designed, again, they go much deeper, but they're designed to cover much of the material um, that you that you'll encounter in some of the core certifications like um, IEPP, CIPP US or CIPM, um, and also on the technical side, um, our Cybersecurity 1 and Cybersecurity 2 courses cover generally the material you would see on a CISSP and some of the other entry level um, cybersecurity certifications and the capstone course um, roughly tracks the certified ethical hacker. Uh, certification. And so, um, you know, we're, we're aware of sort of the relationship, um, but the master's, as this slide shows, really um, kind of gives you that deeper base uh, and offers uh, more substantial earning potential. And so, Julie, let's go to the next slide. Uh, that brings us uh, to the curriculum. Uh, and as Julie mentioned, uh, both Kirk and I uh, teach in this program. Uh, I was thrilled when Kirk approached me when he decided to retire. Uh, we knew each other well from Cyber Ohio and said he wanted to teach. And I said, well, guess what? We're creating our privacy law and management, one of our core courses in the program. Um, for this, I was going to build it myself, but it would be great to have you uh, build and ultimately teach it because of uh, you know, the, the depth of your, your industry experience and perspective. Uh, and so um, we've done that, and Kirk and I have co-taught it the last two semesters, and, and it's his now. Um, for those of you who start in the program, um, either this fall or going forward, um, you'll eventually have Kirk in that in that core course. Um, but let me talk before we turn to that, and I want to bring Kirk back in to talk about it. Let me give you just a quick overview. So for non lawyers who are entering the program, um, we give you a really strong grounding on the legal side with introduction to American law. That's the course that I created and teach uh, and legal writing, um, which goes a little bit more in-depth, it's really legal writing, um, reasoning and research is what it covers. Um, both of those courses are designed to, to give you that kind of boot camp experience for non-lawyers of how do I, how do I under, read, consume and to some extent produce legal materials that are relevant to this field. And each of those courses uh, we have redesigned, um, they're offered in sort of general ways for the general MLS, but we've redesigned them to be specific to cybersecurity and data privacy. So in Introduction to American Law, it's both an introduction into the core um, legal concepts area and, and core legal areas, but it covers, it sort of gives you a survey of the, the major areas you'll encounter in cybersecurity and privacy, everything from uh, constitutional law, criminal law, um, regulatory law, and then core things like civil procedure um, uh, and uh, even to some extent, a little bit of property and contract law. And then legal writing takes you a little bit deeper into that and, and gets you producing some um, legal memoranda and materials uh, to really get your writing skill set up. On the technical side, the first course you'll take is Cybersecurity 1. Um, that dovetails with Cybersecurity 2. Those courses are designed for folks who have no technical background to get up to speed pretty quickly, and we throw you a little bit in the deep end in Cybersecurity 1 by playing around with some pen, pub, some public um, access pen testing tools. Uh, CSU is kind enough to let us uh, whack at their infrastructure, um, and they, they sometimes appreciate the results that we come up with. Uh, and then Cybersecurity 2, um, you go back over the same topics so that you, you reinforce them and get a, a little bit deeper understanding of them, and you work on a group, on a project, um, to create the technical controls for a, an entity like a major educational institution that has multiple regulatory obligations um, that you've got to comply with. Then um, at some point in those first, usually those first two semesters, you'll also have privacy law and management. Uh, that cybersecurity one and two are sort of the three foundational substantive courses in the program for data privacy and cybersecurity. And so privacy law management, I wanna turn over to Kirk and, and let him talk about it because I really, uh, I had a sense of what I wanted to include in it, but I really just let Kirk tell, uh, tell me what he would want to see uh, in a course um, from either, either one of his employees who was sending to take it or from somebody who was thinking to hire. So Kirk, tell us a little bit about how, we've des how we designed and, and, and why you wanted privacy law to manage to look the way it does. Sure. 
Well, you know, so the the name kind of belies my philosophy, right? I understand the law and and the obligations that the law makes upon an organization. <clears throat> What's the risk, in other words? And then management, right? Management is, you know, then how do we how do we do that, right? How do we comply with the law? How do you build how do you build a program that that is designed to interact with, you know, every or I mean, every organization in the organization you have to interact with, right? Because every or every organization, every unit does something with data, and you then you have to also, you know, you have to externally, right? You have, you're interacting with with customers and consumers through your privacy notices and your terms and conditions. Um, you're you're dealing with regulators and you know particularly if in 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 my case having worked in a financial services company right we work with you know a, a dozen different regulators in any given year and and so the the idea really is when you when you come out at the other end of this you you have a good sense of you know the framework the, the legal framework that you have that you have to think about and then the the functional management framework that then kind of gets laid over that to help the organization you know comply with although comply is kind of a you know it's really you know how do you use information in a in a in a in a in a way that is you know consumer friendly as well as at the end of the day right how how do you how does your organization use it as the lifeblood of of what it does? Most most companies today um, are highly dependent upon data of one sort or another, and they're dead in the water if they can't use it. So privacy is not around not using data. Privacy is around how to use data responsibly, uh, so that it's a win win for the consumer who wants your products and services, and for the company who needs the data in order to administer those private those products and services. Uh, including marketing and sales of those products and services. So that in a nutshell is, is how we design is I, I had had a, you know, the privilege, you know, I don't know, was it 10 or so years ago of, of writing a book and kind of building a privacy program that I kind of used as the guide for how we would design this. Although, you know, as, um, as I said about all new people bringing new perspectives too, right. But then designing it with, uh, with Brian also and his his eye towards, uh, I mean, we did tweak it. We we did tweak it, and you know, because he has a, had some very good very good perspectives on this. And um, so, what we've tried to do, and it will evolve, right? So, I mean, since since we put this thing, since we did this last, you know, I'm, I'm in the process now of actually thinking about how we you know how we update the state law section since now since we did this you know california has gone from a ccpa to cpra through a ballot initiative and then colorado and virginia have have also passed state laws in this space state signed passed and signed into law so and then as brian said ohio has uh, has an initiative that we worked on he and i worked on uh, that we hope to pass at some point in the next year or so and so there's a, it's quickly evolving um i will argue that it's 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 still fairly consistent with what california did but uh, there certainly are some uh, there certainly are some differences around the edges depending on where you're doing business yeah and so that's a, that's a, you know a great explanation i i sort of shorthand it as um, we take an operational approach. Um, and yep. so a lot of certainly courses you see in law school, but even in a lot of master's programs, it's kind of a casebook approach where they focus on the court cases and they focus on the, the, I mean, we get into the text of the laws, but what we're really focused on and what makes it really valuable is trying to cut through the specifics or understand how to translate those specifics into a comprehensive program that recognizes you're not going to have 100% just like you can't have 
perfect security. You can't have perfect privacy in the sense of being able to 100% um, cover everything, especially in a large organization that has often really competing privacies and sorry, competing uh, compliance obligations and often competing priorities from both from across business, security, and privacy that you've got to balance. And that's that's really at the essence of um, not only privacy one management, cybersecurity uh, one and two, two in particular, where you're building that, that um, set of technical controls. And, and then in the upper level courses as well, corporate compliance one and two, we pull the lens out more broadly in those courses and look at how does privacy and security fit into a comprehensive compliance program um, and go even more deeply into that operational risk management approach um, because compliance is compliance. And although privacy has its distinctive obligations uh, as does security, ultimately it's, it's that risk-based approach. Um, and you're trying to figure out, well, how, how can the business do what the business needs to do um, while still complying with, with these uh, requirements? Because of course the business's main um, objective um, strategically is not to not to not to be perfectly compliant but you know if it's a business ultimately to make money uh, and to serve its customers and and figuring out how you do that and how you enable the company to do that while still um, managing the risk around compliance is really the focus then the other three courses you see listed there HIPAA and privacy uh, Kirk mentioned at the top um, HIPAA was is is the granddaddy of privacy laws uh, really in the world um, in many respects, and it's still to this day in the United States, the most prescriptive and extensive um, on, the, on privacy and security. And so we use that as the deep dive on the legal side to give you an understanding of what a really extensive uh, law looks like. Um, and HIPAA and all of the major privacy and security laws all map back ultimately to these, these industry frameworks that Kirk mentioned, NIST in particular. Uh, so you get a flavor of that in cybersecurity one and two, we talk about it, privacy law and management and you see that in HIPAA. And so it helps to see how do, I, how do I comply with something really extensive like HIPAA if I am covered by HIPAA and comply with some of these other obligations I have if I've got a consumer facing side, some of the things coming from the FTC uh, and at the state level from CCPA um, and, and how they work together. Uh, and that really is the, the kind of the theme that threads through especially um, the, the legal side, privacy law and management, or one, corp two, HIPAA. Cyber law then takes a different turn. Um, we're really fortunate uh, along with Kirk, we've got a, a really fantastic set of agents, agents with deep experience. Um, cybersecurity one and two are taught by um, industry professionals uh, who really you know, are at the top of the field like Kirk is in privacy. And in cyber law, uh, we're lucky to have a, a prof at the United States Air Force Academy who was part of Cyber Command when he was in active uh, duty. And, um, and, and he covers the international uh, and to, to, uh, goes more deeply into um, the criminal law side of things from an international law perspective um, and looks at that environment where most of the threat actors on cybersecurity are coming from um, and, and how organizations have to work with um, the government really to think about the response and how the public-private partnerships work um, on that level. And then we, and then your final course, um, which you'll always take in your last semesters, the other these other courses, depending on when you enter the program, they'll be offered at different points. Um, although you'll always start with Introduction to American Law and Cybersecurity One and end with the technical capstone. The others will sort of rotate in depending where you're at. The technical capstone then builds um, in particular on some of that those technical skills you acquire in cybersecurity one, as I mentioned before, uh, roughly maps to the certified ethical hacker um, certification in terms of the topics it covers. Um, you'll get to use the cyber range, uh, which is a resource Ohio created to uh, really try to uh, develop more sophisticated education and training resources um, for not only universities, but um, other entities in the state um, and play around with some of those uh, more advanced tools, um, which, you know, which then bookends um, your technical experience. But if you take a look at it, um, what you're really getting is a, is a, is a substantial grounding on the technical side um, and then a really extensive understanding of how do those technical aspects flow through um, the entire program. And so whether you're working specifically on, on, in the compliance role or a legal role, if you're a lawyer, um, or if you're on the technical side and you're, you're trying to understand and work with, which you have to, 
um, the legal and compliance um, and, and business strategic folks, um, you're getting that 360 degree uh, view. And so um, before we move on and, and give you some, well, and actually, Julie, to, to, to kind of wrap up, go to that next line. And, and this is, you know, what I just said, um, you're getting that 360 degree view, legal, business, technical, um, and really covering all of the major dimensions um, with an emphasis on compliance and policy. Um, and so before we move on to the logistics of how to get involved uh, in the program and what the admission process is, I just want to open it for questions. And I meant to actually say at the beginning, feel free to give us questions as we go. Um, but while we're still on the substance, just want to see if anyone has any questions. You can throw them in the Q&A or raise your hand and I'll be happy to turn you on and let you ask it orally. Okay, and feel free to follow up um, with email. Um, if, you, if, you, if you email that MLS online, Julie um, and I both monitor that. She'll usually respond first, but sometimes I'll jump in directly. I, and I wanna emphasize for those of you who either have a legal background, you've got the JD, um, or you're already a cybersecurity professional and you're thinking, well, maybe cybersecurity one and two um, might be too basic for me. Um, I encourage you to reach out to us because we will configure the program um, and in some cases, especially those who have, who have graduate uh, credit in either on either the technical or as a JD, uh, we're sometimes able to accelerate the, the program and give you some um, uh, give you some credit coming in. Uh, unfortunately, it's got to be graduate credit. Uh, undergraduate credits don't count. But either way, we're happy to work with you and think about alternatives. Um, that if you know if you don't feel like you might need, and to talk to you whether you might need uh, some of those foundational courses. And um, we're in the process of developing um, and hope to have online in the next year or so um, some um, electives, which would give you the ability to shape the program a little bit more um, than, than we've got right now. Okay. And so with that, Julie, let's, I'll turn it back to you. And I, actually, I should give Kirk the final word. Kirk, anything, last, last comments you wanted to make about the program or careers here or, or anything else? Thanks, Brian. I Again, I believe that the course of study, as, as Brian described, is, is very well-rounded and the students will come out of this with a, a, wonderful, a wonderful understanding of, a, of virtually all of the issues, both technical and legal and policy, that you'll need to know to sort of hit the ground running, whether you're you know, the only person in the company where you are or or fitting into a into a large organization's uh, existing structure, and uh, I encourage you to uh, to look into you know the program and get get a hold of Julie or Brian, and I, I look forward to hopefully teaching some of you in the future. Excellent, and thanks so much for your time, Kirk. And I forgot to mention um, it was in the slide, but all of our courses are primarily asynchronous. Um, and so you, you, you have to stay within the week schedule. You have a certain amount of material you've got to complete uh, to move on to the next, to the next week because we want to make sure you're moving through uh, expeditiously. But we also include in, in all the courses four, um, sometimes three, but mostly four live classes. Uh, they're optional, though heavily encouraged. And um, though that really gives us an opportunity to get to know you. Uh, and you to get to know both us and your colleagues in the program, um, which we find you know really adds a nice um, dimension to it. So you're not, not simply interacting through the chat. We do interact substantially through the discussion posts. Uh, and so you get to know folks to some extent, but it's really nice to be able to talk. Um, and we tend to use those sessions more uh, to talk through um, questions you have about the substance, but also to sort of get to know you. Because the other thing that we really want you to to understand is that this program, we're committed to you. We get folks that come in from all different um, fields um, and are all, you know, all different points in their careers. Um, and we're, you know, we're really excited to work with you, uh, get to know you, get to know what you wanna do and, and, and give you really advice on how, how you might do that. And, and as I mentioned before, we've got folks like Kirk who really have deep experience in the field and can really say to you, hey, look, you know, here's the kind of thing you ought to do next, or you ought to do in addition to this program, or these are the kinds of um, organizations you might want to target uh, in your career search. And so that's, you know, that's not part of the, the formal coursework, but it's certainly something that all of our faculty are committed 
um, to helping with. And that's that live dimension uh, gives you an opportunity really to talk to us. And, and often, sometimes the, the conversation in those live courses really turns to that as opposed to the substance. And we're happy for it to do that uh, because they're really sort of an enrichment opportunities um, as opposed to core content. And we use them to get really to that personal dimension that we're focused on. Okay, we went a little longer than we planned on the formal stuff. Um, if there aren't any other questions, and I'll give you a second. Then, now, Julie, why don't you um, close us out and let folks know how to get involved. Great. Well, thank you so much to both Brian and Kirk for that informative presentation. Um, I sure got a lot out of it, and I hope all of you did too. And if it inspired you to start this program, um, briefly, we are still accepting applications for fall 2021. The semester begins um, August 23rd, so in just a couple of weeks, our application deadline is August 16th, which is next Monday, I believe. Um, so if you have any questions about the application process, I strongly encourage you to contact me. I'd be happy to set up an individual Zoom call or phone call to go over your background um, and talk to you about whether or not we think this is a good fit for you. And I know Brian would be more than happy to speak to you as well. Um, I've listed the application materials here, but for the interest of time, Again, if you have any questions about those, please let me know. It is also all on our webpage, which is onlinelaw.csuohio.edu. And again, we are still accepting applications up until August 16th. So if you are interested, don't hesitate. We would love to have you as part of our next fall cohort. Um, and that's all that we have for today. Oh, Brian, really, let me Let me just add in that, go back to that slide. It looks like a lot. And, and there's six days till that deadline, we will work with you um, and, and really feel free to contact us before you try to put all that together. And, um, you, know, you know, we'll talk with you and, and get a sense for your credentials and, and, and we really can expedite some of that stuff uh, if you wanna get started this fall. Of course, you know, if you wanna take more time, it's, it, 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 it's perfectly fine to start in the spring, but if anybody's, you know, thinking, hey, I'd really like to do it now because it's right for me, but I don't think I can get that stuff together contact Julie and Julie will work with you. Yes, and so here's my contact information. Because you signed up for this webinar today, you also did receive an email from me. So replying directly back to that email will come right to me. Um, so I really encourage you to reach out to me. It was so nice to have you on the call today. Um, thank you again to Brian and, and to Kirk for this wonderful presentation. And if nobody has any other questions, then we'll conclude. So thank you and I hope you all have a wonderful day.